Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the webinar, ICWA After Adoptive Couple versus Baby Girl, A National and Local Perspective. This is Mary Ann Harvey, and I'm a project specialist for the Court Improvement Project. We are very pleased to have Judge Patrick Rungi join us to share his ICWA knowledge. Um, Patrick is an attorney who has been in practice since 1995, operating his own law firm based in Omaha and servicing the needs of eastern Nebraska. His practice areas have focused on family law, criminal defense, juvenile law, estate planning, and Native American law. Patrick has also worked in Indian country since 1995, serving as a defender for the Winnebago tribe and the Omaha tribe. Since 2003, Patrick has served as a judge for the Winnebago Tribal Court and as chief judge since 2010. Patrick has also served as a judge of the Ponca Tribal Court since 2014. Patrick is a member of the Nebraska Supreme Court Commission on Children in the Courts, where he has served on numerous subcommittees and is the chair of the Tribal State Collaboration Subcommittee. Patrick also served as the president of the Omaha Barristers in 2012. In addition to his private practice and his service to the Winnebago tribe, Patrick has been an adjunct professor at the Creighton University School of Law, teaching Native American law to second and third year law students on a biannual basis since 2012. Patrick is also a faculty member of the Nebraska Victim Advocate Academy held in Omaha. In 2015, Patrick was appointed as defense counsel to the District 6 Adult Drug Court based in Blair, Nebraska. In this role, Patrick advocates on behalf of participants in the drug court, being their voice and protecting their interests as they work towards achieving a sober life through the structure of the drug court process. In 2016, Patrick began serving as the authorized attorney responsible for the civil establishment and enforcement of child support in Washington County. In this role, Patrick is responsible for the civil representation of the county's interests in child support with regards to establishing, modifying, and enforcing child support obligations for parents in Washington County District Court. Patrick is a 1994 graduate of the Creighton University School of Law. Outside of his legal practice, Patrick is a sports writer covering Nebraska football for his website, The Double Extra Point. He resides in Omaha with his wife, Mary Beth, and their two boys, Talika and Trinnell, their dog, and two cats. He is also an active member of St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Millard. Um, just a reminder to please mute your phones um, by pressing star six. And I wanted to let everyone know that Judge, Judge Rungi's connection is sometimes dropping out, um, but he will be on as soon as um, it reconnects. So please bear with us and stay on the line. Thanks so much, and I'll turn it over to you, Judge Rungi. Thank you, Marianne. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. I will apologize in advance. I'm not sure why my computer is not cooperating with me, but I will uh, I will work to kind of try to stay on track as best we can uh, to to move through the process. Um, if you have any questions, there's a chat window at the at least on my screen. It's the bottom right hand corner. Um, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court case, adoptive couple versus baby girl, uh, and then I will kind of stop and take some questions on that case, and then we will then discuss a Nebraska case which uses the adoptive couple language. Um, and so if you have any questions about that case, then we can ask at that time. So um, let's go ahead and we'll just get right to the heart of the matter with regard to the ultimate holding from adoptive couple versus baby girl, 2013 case, um, which you know, assuming for the sake of argument that biological father is a quote unquote parent under the ICWA, neither, and then there's two sections that we'll discuss, bars the termination of his parental rights. We'll, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of those particular sections, and a, a new rationale that the Supreme Court used to come to the conclusion that they came to, although we'll find out that at least at some level, the rationale is very similar to uh, a theory that has been around for some time in this area. So we'll talk in, in a sense, the, get the factual basis in terms of what the case was about. It's a South Carolina case where we had a mom that uh, became pregnant with baby girls. Um, the, the girl's name is Veronica, and so a lot of the references to this particular case will also refer to it as the baby Veronica case. Uh, so that, that, those are that, talking about the same thing. Um, the 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 two whoa, the two were uh, 
the two parents were separate, and the biological father did not provide any kind of either material or financial support to uh, baby girl's mom either before or after birth. Um, shortly after the child was born, mom sends a text to dad basically saying, hey, do you want to pay child support or do you want to relinquish your parental rights? Um, dad texts back and says that he'd rather just give up his rights. And the, 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 there's, there's some additional things that happen with regards to the relinquishment as well. But the majority opinion, Justice Alito's opinion, does go back to that, particularly that text conversation on a number of occasions. So it was clearly important to Justice Alito that uh, the bio dad had made that decision. Um, bio dad's a member of the Cherokee Nation, um, but during the course of the state court case, um, the, when that case started, bio mom provided information to the uh, bio mom provided information to the court with regards to bio dad, um, and they she misspelled his name and uh, got the, his date of birth wrong. So when the Cher when the Cherokee Nation did their investigation into the tribal roles, they couldn't find him, and that limited the Cherokees' ability then to come in and intervene in the case because they couldn't verify his enrollment status. Uh, bio mom also listed uh, baby girl's ethnicity as Hispanic instead of Native American. Mom was Hispanic, um, and it's unclear from the factual basis if bio mom did that intentionally in attempt to sort of avoid the the structures of the ICWA, or if she did it unintentionally. That was just her best knowledge with regards to uh, what the underlying facts were. So. Uh, about four months after Veronica was born, mom decided to put the child up for adoption. And the adoptive couple in this case, the, 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 the titular plaintiff, began their South Carolina proceedings. Dad got served with the adoption papers and signed the uh, paperwork saying that he did not contest the adoption. Um, he then would later testify that he thought he was only relinquishing to the bio mom, didn't know that it was in the course of adoption process. I'm not entirely certain how that would work or how credible that is. But there's also some very specific um, relinquishment proceedings in the ICWA that the, opin the majority opinion just doesn't really get into in terms of whether or not or how they were observed. So um, after the adoption proceeding was commenced, then the Cherokee Nation ultimately was able to identify that, yes, uh, bio dad is a member of the Cherokee Nation, and therefore that the child uh, is also likely a member of, or eligible to be a member of the Cherokee Nation. The nation intervened in the adoption, and bio dad said, "No, no, no! I do not want. Uh, I do not consent to this adoption. I do not uh, want to go forward with this." So they had a trial in the South Carolina court. The 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 trial court in South Carolina found that baby girl Veronica was an Indian child for equal purposes. And of course, an adoption is a uh, child custody proceeding under which the ICWA applies, which means that all of the requirements with regard to the ICWA need to be observed. Uh, so BioDad's the parent, and that um, the that adoptive couple did not comply with the ICWA's requirements for the parental consent to the adoption. So whatever consent that BioDad provided with regards to the adoption wasn't sufficient to satisfy the requirements of, of the ICWA. So the trial court said no, denied the adoption petition, and awarded BioDad custody of baby Veronica. The South, went up to the South Carolina Supreme Court. The South Carolina Supreme Court affirmed, and adoptive couple uh, then appealed that case to the oh, United really? States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So. Um, We'll talk in more detail about it, but this is the too long, didn't read version of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, the majority opinion went back to the underlying purpose uh, of the Indian Child Welfare Act, talking about removal of, trying to prevent removal of children from Indian homes. Um, dad never had custody, never had any uh, legal or physical custody, and because he had relinquished his rights, then the court found that the, in, the, the ICWA's 
goal mm -hmm. with regards to preventing hmm. uh, removal didn't apply. That's interesting. Um, and then because the ick was because the ick was gold didn't apply to the uh, biological dad. Um, if since the uh, since the Supreme Court found that the ick was gold didn't apply because he never had custody in the first place, and so there was never any custody to protect. Um, and because, and this was a this was a focus of the majority opinion's ruling, because they didn't want to create a policy where a biological father could play a quote unquote ICWA trump card at the last minute to frustrate the wishes of a biological mom and, at least in the court's opinion, the best interest of the child, the Supreme Court found that the bio dad did not get the protections of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Therefore, because the protections of the ICWA didn't apply, baby girl's custody was removed from dad and the adoption was permitted to go forward with adoptive couple. Okay, so let's go to the majority rationale. It's a 5-4 decision. Justice Alito writes the majority opinion. Uh, uh, Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy joined with Justice Alito's majority ruling. Um, one of the statutes that uh, are really fundamental to the majority uh, uh, ruling in this case was the 1972F. Um, the evidence, uh, what, what's required to terminate parental rights. And, and you can see the language that's in place. The highlighted language I put in there is in the third language down. The Evidence has to be that continued custody of the child by the parent or Indian custodian is likely to result in serious emotional or physical damage. So, so there's an underlying uh, requirement the majority finds that the continued custody is sort of the hub around which the protection of a parental rights uh, termination revolves. Um, the Equus 1912F uh, protections in the majority opinions, in the, in the majority's opinion, uh, is terminated only if that continued custody would result in harm to the child. As kind of a necessary corollary, then the majority makes the determination that continued custody, because continued custody has to refer to custody as a pre-existing state, has to be or resumed after an eruption. So the majority finds that if a in the a parent or Indian custodian has custody and that custody's continuation would be harmful, that's what, that's what the 1912F provision of the ICWA applies. But according to the majority rationale, if the parent never had custody in the first place, then they never had continuing custody. And if the parent never had continuing custody, then there's no way that that continuing custody could harm the child, and so the protection of 1912F doesn't apply. The other statute, the, the second statute that the majority opinion kind of has to grapple with in terms of how, it handle, how it's handled is 1912D, the remedial services uh, language. And this is where you get the requirements for active efforts, where the uh, government has to provide active efforts uh, to prevent the breakup of the Indian family and that those active efforts have been unsuccessful. Um, in this case, the majority found that the 1912D active efforts did not apply because they required an ongoing relationship to sever. The, 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 the language of 1912D talks about the breakup of the Indian family. And if there's no Indian family to break up, the majority rationale was, then the 1912D language didn't apply and therefore the, they wouldn't, it wouldn't act to prevent the termination of a parental rights. And, and you can kind of see the, the quote from the majority opinion really kind of boils that down. When an Indian parent abandons an Indian child prior to birth and the child has never been with the Indian parent's legal or physical custody, there's no relationship that would be discontinued by the termination of the parental rights. So based the, on the fact that there was no relationship, the court found that the protections of 1912D did not apply. Um, now, this kind of harkens back to something that originated in the 80s called the existing Indian family doctrine. Um, there's no specific reference in the adoptive couple decision to the existing fa uh, Indian family doctrine. Um, but if you, and we'll kind of go through some of the history of it, you can kind of see that 
it really is, does contain the echoes of that language. The basic premise of the existing Indian family doctrine is if there's no existing Indian family to prevent the breakup, then equal protections don't apply. It was, it's been, it was used by a number of state courts uh, to functionally say when equal protections did and did not apply to particular cases. Um, it originated in Kansas in 1982 in a case called In Ray Baby Boy L. And take, here's the language from the Kansas case that talks about why ICWA wouldn't apply in what was fundamentally a very similar circumstance to the biological father in this case. The overriding concern of Congress was the maintenance of the family and tribal relationship in existing in Indian homes. It was not to dictate that an illegitimate infant who has never been a member of an Indian home should be removed from its primary cultural heritage and placed in an Indian environment over the express objections of its non-Indian mother. That's the language in Baby Boy L in 1982 that Kansas used to say that the ICWA didn't apply in a circumstance where there wasn't an established Indian family already. Now, so that's the language from Kansas in 1982. Here's the language from adoptive couple in 2013. A biological Indian father could abandon his child in utero and refuse to provide any support for the birth mother perhaps contributing to the mother's decision to put the child up for adoption and then could play his ICWA trump card at the 11th hour to override the mother's decision and the child's best interest. Okay, so you can, kind of, you can see the, the, language is, you know, the, the, the language is different, but the fundamental premise between Baby Boy L in 1982 and adoptive couple in 2013 is the same. If you have a parent who hasn't been involved and who isn't part of this existing family, then that uh, parents should not be able to, as Justice Alito say, play his equi over, uh, equi trump card and override the mother's decision and the child's best interest. Um, uh, if you could advance the slide, please. The existing Indian family doctrine um, started in Kansas in 1982, and it's kind of picked up some steam in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Missouri, California, South Dakota, Nevada were some states that had adopted that as, and, and fundamentally what it did was it limited the amount of cases and the amount of circumstances where the ICWA applied. It only applied where the parents were already involved with the children and then the children were removed from those Indian parents. It didn't apply in a case like uh, this where the uh, Indian parent in this circumstance was never involved uh, and never had an opportunity to be involved with uh, the, the child in question. Um, so it's also been, uh, the Indian, existing Indian family doctrine has also been rejected in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, a number of state Supreme Courts have said no to the existing Indian family doctrine. Uh, the BIA guidelines talk specifically about how the existing Indian family doctrine is contrary to the underlying rationale and purpose of the Indian Child Welfare Act to make sure that tribes are the ones that are making decisions for their children instead of allowing state courts to do so. Um, and actually, the Supreme Court of the state of Kansas, the one who originated the existing Indian family doctrine, overruled its own decision in 2009 uh, and no longer follows that case law. Um, Although Justice Alito never actually says the phrase existing Indian family doctrine, never specifically adopts it, um, it, it's pretty hard to come to any other conclusion other than he is taking that underlying rationale and adopting it as the as case law going forward. So while he never says it explicitly, the, it, is, it is an almost inescapable conclusion coming out of adoptive couple versus baby girl that the existing Indian family doctrine is the law of the land in terms of the interpretation of the ICWA going forward. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. The third statute that the majority kind of had to grapple with to determine whether or not uh, the adoption should go forward was 1915A, talking about the adoptive placement preferences. In uh, a adoption involving an Indian child, there has to be a certain level of placement preferences. In other words, you have to follow a certain set of rules in terms of where you place the child for adoption. 
um, an adoptive couple, who in this case was a non-native family, is always going to be at the bottom of that list for an adoptive placement preference. So if the court was going to come to the conclusion that the adoption should go forward, then it had to grapple with how you, you deal with the adoptive placement. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, the court, by in, in avoiding that, what the court found was that no other party came forward to actually make an attempt at adoption. There was no uh, member of the Cherokee Nation that came forward. Um, there was no other Indian family that came forward and made a request to adopt the child. And the biological father's request to have the child, have custody of the child, didn't count because BioDead wasn't adopting the child. Obviously, there was no adoption because he's, his parental rights were still intact. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 in that circumstance because the adoption placement preferences wouldn't protect BioDad uh, because he hadn't the adoption hadn't gone forward yet. Once the adoption went forward and his rights were terminated as a result, then the only way to get that back would be through the course of an adoption. So, so those are the three provisions of the ICWA that the majority opinion, uh, the majority in Justice Alito made a determination did not apply to allow the adoption from adoptive couple to go forward. So, um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Fourth vote in favor of the uh, uh, in, for, in favor of the ruling was from Justice Thomas. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, Justice Thomas has long been a critic and, a, and has questioned the underlying constitution of the Indian Child Welfare Act as a whole. Uh, in fact, Justice Thomas has really questioned the broader uh, fundamental basis of the uh, jurisprudence of the Supreme Court with regards to the Indian Child Welfare Act, saying that the Com Indian Commerce Clause of the Constitution gives Congress plenary power over uh, determinations with regards to the federal government's relations with uh, Native American tribes. Justice Thomas has real questions, and, and I think if pushed would probably say that that's an incorrect interpretation of that clause and would invalidate and undo a significant part of that uh, jurisprudence that's gone all the way back to Marbury versus Madison. Uh, so um, it's not then surprising that he would concur with the result, because uh, Justice Thomas's position is basically it was con unconstitutional as a whole, so the biological parents should not have the protection of that statute in this particular case, because he shouldn't have the protection of the statute in its entirety. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, the next, the uh, the fifth vote was from Justice Breyer, and, and this was really the determining factor in terms of uh, how the decision ultimately came down as it did. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Justice Breyer really wanted to limit the holding in adoptive couple to this particular case. Um, Justice Breyer said that. This case does not speak to a father with next to no involvement with the child. He, he was, Justice Breyer was concerned that this was just a true bad facts case with regards to the uh, Native American interest in this case. So he said that he would vote the way he voted in this case, but he didn't say like if there was a father with next to no involvement. So if the father had done something with regards to the child, but not just not a big nothing burger that this particular uh, biological father did, then the result might be different. Um, he said that the result might be different if the father was deceived or didn't know about the child. Um, or um, there's a the Justice Breyer said that the tribes in the ICWA have a right. The, the ICWA lays out a adoptive placement preference, but tribes can individually change what their adoptive placement preferences are. So um, in that circumstance, Justice Breyer said that if the tribe had done that, 
it might have a different result. I don't really understand how that could be, because the majority's ruling was that nobody came forward to adopt the child. So at a sense, it doesn't matter what the tribe's adoptive placement preferences were. If there's nobody that is there to adopt a child other than the adoptive couple, if there's only one potential adoptive couple or adoptive party, then it doesn't matter what your preferences are, one's always going to come first. So it, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's you can tell that Justice Breyer was uncomfortable about the particular facts of the case. And when we get into Justice Sotomayor's uh, dissent with regards to uh, at the getting into some of Justice Alito's uh, decision, then we'll, we'll see a little bit of maybe where that comes from. Um, we had a dis if you could advance to the next slide, please. We had a dissenting opinion from Justice Scalia, uh, proving once again that cases like this make strange bedfellows in the Supreme Court when you have Justice Breyer uh, making the casting, in a sense, the deciding vote. Uh, along with uh, Justice Alito and Justice Roberts, and Justice Scalia on the other side of the case. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Justice Scalia just didn't buy Justice Alito's argument that continued custody meant that it had to have been having custody prior to the case. And that, and that really, that's a necessary implication. If, if you don't, if you read the phrase continuous custody as you had to have custody before the incident took place that would give rise to the ICWA protections, um, you, have to, you, have to, you have to read continued custody that way to come to Justice Alito's uh, decision. Um, Justice Scalia thought that the phrase continued custody could easily be referenced custody in the future as well. And if that's what the phrase continued custody means, then the provisions of 1912F would be applicable, and the provisions of the ICWA would, would have to be observed going forward to uh, any adoption with regards to an Indian child. Um, Justice Scalia also raised the question of why the majority uh, was engaged in a best interest analysis in this case. Remember, the contest in this case was between BioDad who's biological parent of the child, and adoptive couple, who is not. And fundamentally, Justice Scalia says, why are we having a best interest fight between a biological parent and a not biological parent? That runs counter to all of the other jurisprudence we have with regards to a constitutionally protected right to parent a child. Um, advance to the next slide, please. Um, the, uh, the other major dissenting opinion was from Justice Sotomayor. Um, if we could advance to the next slide, please. Justice Sotomayor went back and had a conversation and looked at the underlying purpose of the Indian Child Welfare Act and went back to some of, the, some of the provisions of the ICWA that Justice Alito didn't refer to in the majority opinion, um, talking about how for Indian tribes there's no resource greater than its children and how there was an alarmingly high percentage of Indian children placed in non-Indian homes. Clearly, that's, those are two issues which arose and concerns which would have covered the circumstance in uh, baby Veronica's uh, adoption. She reflected that the Cherokee Nation had asked that, uh, had, the, had the Cherokee Nation asked to transfer the adoption to tribal court, the transfer would have been mandatory absent good cause to the contrary. And given the fact that the underlying South Carolina court actually prevented the adoption from going forward, it, it's at least reasonable to infer what the South Carolina court might have done had that transfer been requested. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, more, uh, more importantly, Justice Sotomayor really kind of reflects on, OK, what does this mean? What happens? What does an ICWA proceeding look like? now that we have this rationale in adoptive couple versus baby girl. You have a circumstance now where you have an adoptive parent, or excuse me, a biological parent, such as the biological father in this case, who clearly has, the ICWA guarantees him a right to participate in the process, but doesn't give him any substantive uh, rights to protect. 
so he gets to be a part of the equa or he gets to be a part of the case but actually doesn't give him anything to protect his rights as he's watching the process go forward um, also um, justice Sotomayor kind of gets to the heart of ultimately why this looks like it's a she, in a sense kind of calls out Justice Alito and saying this looks like a bad facts case and asks why Justice Alito reflects on the the first sentence of the the first sentence of the opinion sort of gives the game away in terms of where Justice Alito is coming from. This case is about a little girl who is classified as an Indian because she is 1.2%, 3 256 Cherokee. Because baby girl is classified in this way, the South Carolina Supreme Court required her to be taken at the age of 27 months to the only parents she's ever known. So, I mean, obviously, anytime you have a circumstance where there's a, a contested adoption and, and something like this, it's always going to be a hard case. But Justice Sotomayor is asking why Justice Alito is engaging in a conversation about whether baby Veronica is Indian enough for the ICWA to apply. Uh, because it's pretty clear jurisprudence throughout uh, the Supreme Court's history in this area that if there's any right that is preserved to a tribe, it is the right to determine who is a member of that tribe. Uh, if there's if there's anything that is protected and enshrined as a right of a tribe, it is that right is that right to determine for the tribe to make a determination as to who's a member of that tribe, who is who's in and who's out. And Justice Sotomayor is saying fundamentally, this case happened. The result of this case happened because Justice Alito felt like Baby Veronica wasn't Indian enough for the protections of the ICWA to apply. And so he came up with a rationale or came up with a result that meant that it didn't in this case. Next slide, please. Um, any questions on adoptive couple versus baby girl? I asked that question fully understanding that I can't see any of them. So Marianne, if, if there are any questions in the chat window that you can maybe forward to me, I can try to respond to them. Otherwise, we can just go forward and I'll, I'll move on to the Nebraska case. Hi, Judge Rungi, it's Mary Ann. There's no questions in the box right now, um, okay. but I, I will let you know if there are and read them to you. And I just okay. want to remind everyone, I think someone has their phone not on mute and is walking around with it or talking to coworkers in the background. So please, if that's you, could you please mute your phone? Thank you. Okay, and, and, and I want to apologize again to the participants for our technical difficulties. We'll, we'll soldier on as best we can. If we could go to the next slide, please. So adoptive couple versus baby girl was a 2013 case. Um, we have seen it pop up now in Nebraska case law in uh, in Ray interest of Tavy and B. Uh, Justice Wright uh, wrote the majority uh, opinion in this case. Uh, next slide, please. In this case, uh, Tavian was adjudicated under 43247-3A, and then 16 months after the adjudication, the state moved to terminate the parental rights. Um, at that point in time, BioDad um, moved to transfer the jurisdiction of the case from state court to the Oglala Sioux Tribal Court. Prior to, before the, before the uh, motion to terminate parental rights, or excuse me, before the motion to transfer was heard, the state had withdrawn its motion to terminate uh, its parental rights. The juvenile court denied the motion to transfer, citing that the proceedings were in an advanced stage. Uh, BioDad then appealed the denial of the motion to transfer to the Nebraska Supreme Court. Next slide, please. The state's argument, uh, in part, rested on the uh, language from the adoptive couple case uh, and specifically asked the Supreme Court to revisit its decisions from uh, Zylena R. and Adriana R. In that case, the, in that, in that case the Nebraska Supreme Court said, that the best interest of the child should not be a factor in deciding whether or not a case should be transferred from a state court to a tribal court. Um, in asking the court to 
change that rule, in other words, to allow a, ju uh, a state court to take the best interest of the child into consideration when determining whether or not a case should transfer, uh, the state went back and looked at and used the language from adoptive couple talking about Justice Alito's concerns that a biological father could take no actions to support a child and then could play his Iqua Trump card at the 11th hour to override the mother's interest and the child's best interest. That's the language that actually the state was hooking on to, to try to say why now that adoptive couple has been decided that we should now look at the child's best interest in determining whether or not a case uh, should transfer, particularly in a case circumstance like this, because if you're going to have if you're going to have the concept of an equa trump card, this is kind of what it looks like. And so the state's argument was that the rationale from adoptive couples should apply as a result. Next slide, please. There's four reasons in which the Tavian B court said no to that, and and why a child's best interest should not be considered in making a determination about a transfer to uh, tribal court. First of all, um, in 2015, the BIA guidelines were amended. The, the BIA put out a set of guidelines in the 70s, basically giving some guidance as to how the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, would suggest the ICWA be applied and interpreted. Those were updated in 2015. And specifically in that 2015 update, the, the BIA had suggested that um, advanced stages should not be considered as a mechanism or a guideline as to when a transfer to tribal court should be denied. Um, the Supreme Court had previously talked about the BIA guidelines as being persuasive and instructive, although clearly they're not mandatory precedent. Um, so that was one of the reasons why the Nebraska Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to use best interest. Uh, we're not going to consider that. Um, additionally, the context, the, the context from adoptive couple wasn't speaking with regards to a transfer case. A as we know, the adoptive couple was talking about whether an adoption should be uh, permitted as a result. Transfer cases weren't considered by adoptive couple. And so the Nebraska Supreme Court functionally said, that adoptive couple didn't speak directly to this question uh, with regards to a transfer. Uh, next slide, please. Transfer cases, the Nebraska Supreme Court reflected, there's a presumption of transfer to tribal court unless there's good cause to the contrary. The, by saying no to the child's best interest, fundamentally what the Nebraska Supreme Court said that if we're using a child's best interest, you're negating that presumptive tribal jurisdiction. Um, and particularly uh, on, for Indi uh, Indian children who don't reside on the reservation. And it, and it undermines the federal policy of ensuring that Indian child welfare determinations aren't made on a basis of a, quote, white middle class standard, which in many cases forecloses placement with an Indian family. So it gets kind of back to the question of the purpose of a transfer hearing is not so much what the decision should be about the children, but who should make those decisions, whether it's more appropriate for a tribe to make a decision about its kids or whether it's appropriate for a state to make, uh, for the state to make those decisions. Next slide, please. And that really gets to kind of the heart of, of ultimately the decision that the Tavian B Court makes. Uh, transfer proceedings, uh, ICWA in general and transfer proceedings specifically aren't about the substance of the decisions. They're about which court, tribal or state, gets to make those decisions. Preclusion of a separate best interest standard by state court does not suggest that the best interests of the child are ignored altogether. To the contrary, the best interests of the Indian child are considered regardless of which court decides the matter. The question before a state court in, in considering a motion transfer to tribal court is simply which tribunal should make that decision. And that really gets to the nub of the question. At a transfer hearing, the question becomes which jurisdiction, which court, tribal or state, is best fitted to make a decision about a child of that tribe. Uh, and the presumption in those proceedings is that it's the tribal court that's best fit to make a decision about the tribal child, and that a state court should only make that determination under certain circumstances. And an advanced stage of the proceedings is not one of those that would make that decision. Next slide, please. 
Um, stated in another way, recognizing best interest as good cause for denying the transfer to tribal court permits state courts to decide that it is not in the best interest of Indian children to have a tribal court determine what is in their best interest. By enacting ICWA, Congress clearly stated otherwise. So fundamentally, um, the, 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 the Supreme Court is reflecting the fact that, um, that these, are, these are not decisions with regards to the merits of the case on a transfer case. It's about which court is best suited to be making those determinations or making those decisions. Uh, next slide, please. There was a partial dissent in uh, Tavian B um, that really didn't go to the underlying uh, determination or decision in the matter, but gets, a, gets in, a little, in a little more detail in terms of what, uh, what the underlying case law is. Next slide, please. Justice Stacey's uh, dissent does give us kind of a little bit of a guidepost in terms of where uh, ICWA determinations on, in the Nebraska State Court might be coming in the future. Um, Justice Stacey's uh, uh, decide, uh, uh, suggests that at advanced stages could be used in a case to deny transfer if it's combined with other factors. So Justice Stacey's position was that it can't be used all by itself, but if you take advanced stages and you combine it with other factors, that that might be part of the evidence that the state could use to resist or uh, deny a transfer. Um, that's not the majority opinion, so, so to be clear, that's Justice Stacey's dissenting uh, opinion, but that there is at least that, um, there, there is at least that language that's in the, that's in the dissent. Um, Justice Stacey observed that there's never been a it's never been clear what the burden is in terms of, it's clear that the burden is on the state to show good cause, but it's never been clear as to how much evidence the state has to use to show good cause. In the dissent, she suggests that it should be by clear and convincing evidence. Again, it's part of the dissent, so that's not the actual law of the case, but going forward, if you're looking at, um, if you're looking at transfer cases going forward, um, then you can, um, then uh, you can look at that as uh, as a uh, a guidepost. Um, the Justice Stacey disagreed with um, the 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 holding of the Supreme Court in this case. Actually, made a finding that the lower court had abused its discretion by fa uh, by not uh, transferring the case. And fundamentally, she didn't think that was fair to the trial court. She said that. Making such a finding basically says that the the lower court abused its discretions by not anticipating that we would change the law. So instead, she would have just done it differently and said that what we should have done was just remanded it to the lower court with a direction on how to proceed. Next slide, please. Um, at this point in time, it's open for questions either on TAV and B or if there's any questions with regards to adoptive couple. Do we have any? Someone is typing right now. Um, so the question from Dorothy Benton is, are there any other cases currently being decided in this area? In, I'm, I'm not aware of any that are bubbling through in Nebraska. I'm sure there will be. I'm not aware of what they may or may not be. She says thanks. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Um, I guess I have a question. I'm wondering okay. what you think a case like um, adoptive couple, if that was the set of facts, like very similar set of facts, what that would look like in Nebraska. Well, I mean, at a sense, it's, I mean, adoptive couple versus baby girl is the law of the land now. So. So that that's adoptive couple is going to inform how that case is going to work. You'd have to make if you're arguing. So if you're arguing on behalf of the adoptive couple in that case, you know you you pull out your adoptive couple language uh, case and you're feeling pretty good. Um, you would have to make 
the, the, the argument for the biological parent who's trying to resist the adoption, you would have to rely on differences in the Nebraska Indian Child Welfare Act to the language in the, the federal Indian Child Welfare Act and try to convince a court that regardless of the outcome in adoptive couple, the fact that there is a, a different state statutory guideline would result in a uh, would result in a different outcome. Thank you. Yeah, Amanda Doctor just typed that the Nebraska ICWA allows for uniting parents. So, and that's and and that, and that's B. Now, you know the again, you're it, it's a good question, and I think it will be an open question because if you're the adoptive couple or you're the adoptive parents, I, I think you've got a pretty strong argument that the Supreme Court's made a pretty clear determination in terms of at least how the federal ICWA should be um, uh, should be applied. And you, in other words, you really have to lean hard on language like what would be in the Nebraska Indian Child Welfare Act to to try to show that a different result. You, you fundamentally have to show that the Nebraska Indian Child Welfare Act provides a different and higher standard of protection than the, the federal act does. And, and you're relying entirely on the difference between, uh, between the Nebraska Act and the federal act. And, and that, that's, I suspect, we'll be seeing that litigation. OK, thank you. Um, Amanda Doctor typed another question, which is, does the definition of parent in the Nebraska ICWA affect this, where a bio father has to acknowledge or establish paternity? Probably. It's a good question. Um, and I would have to, you know, I would have to, I would have to look, and I don't know that off the top of my head, if the definition of parent in the Nebraska Indian Child Welfare Act is different than the, the, the federal act. I, I think it is. And, and again, any, in a circumstance like this where you have a case like adoptive couple, which really enshrines that existing Indian family doctrine and, and limits fairly, fairly significantly the applicability of the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, you could really see a set of circumstances where you have differing state-by-state -state rules if the state Indian Child Welfare Act language is broader and provides more protection than the federal language does, and particularly given how adoptive couple came down. OK, does anyone else have any questions? Hey. hey. I'm not seeing anything in the chat box, Judge Rungi. So thank you okay. so much for providing this webinar and for hanging with us through the um, Technical problems. I think the, um, I think the technical difficulties were on my end, so I'm just going to go ahead and apologize <laughs> for that. Um, the last okay. slide on the the last slide on the slideshow has my contact information. So if there's any, anybody that has any specific questions or just wants to chat about something in this area, I would be more than happy to hear from you. Great, thank you so much. And um, just uh, for everyone on the webinar, you can download the slides if you go up to the top um, on the right side and click on ICWA after ACVBG PowerPoint. Click on that and download the file and you, you would have that um, available to you. And we'll also have a copy of this available on the CIP website. So thanks so much again, Judge Rungi. You're getting some thank, thank yous in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody's time this morning. Take care.